Welcome everyone, I'm Madeline DiNono, President and CEO of the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media. With me is our esteemed ASL interpreters, Mara Bassani and Darcy French Meyerson. Please click on the globe icon on the bottom of your screen if you would like to see our interpreters and closed captioning is also available at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that in Los Angeles and in New York, we are currently on the traditional lands of the Chumash and Lenape peoples. We want to recognize that we are all connected with one another and that the ground beneath our feet is historically the home of indigenous peoples. Today's discussion would not be possible without the generous support of Craig Newmark Philanthropies. With me today are leaders from the International Women's Media Foundation, right to be and an award-winning journalist to discuss the complexity and real world impact of online abuse and will explore how the media industry can play a transformative role in addressing these issues and also learn what actions, resources and tools are available to help keep us all safe. So without further ado, I would love to introduce our founder and chair, two-time Academy Award winner, Gina Davis. Hey, everybody. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you. So um, great uh, to have you all here. We appreciate it. Uh, as so many of you know by now, we have had the privilege to work with Craig Newmark Philanthropies for the past several years. Craig is committed to supporting organizations who are working to make the world a safer place for women and girls. Today's topic of online violence and harassment is very timely and so important as it deals with something most of us have faced at some point in our lives, whether it's directly or it's something that we're witnessing in the media or across social platforms. So in just a few minutes, we will hear from experts who can speak to the real world impact of online violence, specifically targeting women and gender expansive journalists. As you will hear, it often silences their voices, which hurts us all. The silence is deafening. So we'll learn what actions and resources and tools are available to help keep us all safe and how the media industry can play a transformative role in addressing these issues. And now it is my honor and privilege to introduce our next speaker, our dear friend, Craig Newmark, founder of Craigslist and Craig Newmark Philanthropies. Over to you, Craig. Hey, fo hey folks. <laughs> um, for some time, I've been seeing way too much online harassment, online bullying. Oh, I've seen a lot of it personally and professionally as well. And frankly, it really pisses me off. I'd like to do what I can to fight it, but I'm not terribly smart and fighting it effectively requires social skills. And like, I'm a nerd. So I figure I'll help out the folks at the Gina Davis Institute, the International Women's Media Foundation and Right to Be. They're folks who know how to deal with these problems. So I figured I would turn my support to them to actually get something done. Uh, the deal is, I, and I really am pissed off about it, but I'm a nerd. I don't know what I should be doing myself. Uh, but like uh, the Batman says, I am uh, I may not be the nerd you want, but I'm the nerd you got. But I know to turn it over to people with the skills to fight bullying and harassment. Next up, um, next up, we do have uh, uh, Lisa Lise Munoz, who's the director of the International Women's Media Foundation. Elisa, please uh, take it over for me. Thank you so much, Craig. And we're so appreciative of your support, which makes it possible to address this issue. As Gina said, the, real the reality is that online violence silences women's voices and is one of the most pernicious threats to press freedom that we're seeing at the IWMF. Women in public spaces face online violence simply for doing their jobs. Journalists, in particular women journalists and journalists of color, bear the brunt of online attacks because of who they are and because of their reporting. 
For years, they've been subjected to sexual harassment, death threats, threats of sexual violence, and attempts to undermine their reporting. But these attacks are becoming more coordinated, and journalists are frequently being targeted by well-orchestrated online campaigns designed to threaten as well as to discredit them and their work. The most recent report published by UNESCO and ICFJ states that 73% of women journalists said they had experienced online violence. This includes threats of physical and sexual violence. And we know that for women in particular, it often includes threats against their families and their children, particularly threats of sexual violence against their daughters. This is a terrifying situation because it's difficult for a journalist sitting at home to assess how credible these threats may be. Coupled with the data that shows that 20% of the journalists said that they had been attacked or abused offline according to, after incidents that were seated online. So what do we mean by seated online? We've seen leaders in the media as well as in government use their bully pulpits as opportunities to go after women journalists, women journalists of color and other underrepresented groups. These attacks are coordinated and orchestrated and they follow the same pattern. They unleash fringe groups who gratuitously jump on the bandwagon, which leads to the perception that this is a random occurrence and the result of mob activity on the internet, but it truly is not. We've seen former President Donald Trump, Rodrigo Duterte of the Philippines, Brazil's former president, Rodrigo Bolsonaro, Mexico's Andres Manuel Lopez Albrador, and all of them are leaders that take pride in and make it a point to target women journalists. The strategy is clear. The attacks are meant to intimidate them and to discredit and undermine their reporting. Just a few days ago, we saw this scenario playing out as a result of a White House press conference. After asking Indian Prime Minister Modi a question about India's human rights record, Wall Street Journal reporter Sabrina Siddiqui was and continues to be subjected to unrelenting online abuse. This is a tactic that we've seen Modi employ against numerous women journalists in India, and now he's using the government-sanctioned online abuse machine to target journalists outside of India as well. This is truly unacceptable. Other tactics that these people use when they're attacking women journalists is doxing, which is the publication of their location online, swatting, calling armed police to their homes. These are tactics commonly used against journalists in the United States. Abusers also dig through their social media for photos, resurface old social media posts, open fake accounts in their name, all with the aim of discrediting and embarrassing them. The impact of online violence against women journalists is staggering. Women journalists report that they are self-censoring because of online violence. This is not just a loss for them, but it's a loss for society. With each woman journalist silence, we lose a valuable voice in the news media. Nearly one third of women journalists have considered leaving the profession as a result of online violence. On a personal level, there are serious mental health implications to these onslaughts. The IWMF research shows that journalists experiencing online attacks suffer similarly to those who are suffering from PTSD. Adding to the burden is the inability of journalists to simply go offline. Journalists need to engage with their audiences directly, and to do this, they often use their personal social media and publish content and respond to followers, which opens them up to extremely high levels of horrific abuse. Legal remedies in the U.S. are also incredibly difficult to come by. Often journalists are told by law enforcement to simply get offline, and the recent Supreme Court decision appears to protect online abuse under the First Amendment. We've yet to see just how this decision might play out in the legal system, but at first glance, it seems to limit the ability to hold those engaging in online violence legally accountable. Losing the voice of these, gen of these journalists will not only increase gender inequity, it will limit diversity and the diversity of perspectives in the news that we consume. I'll say it again, this will be a loss for our society. With each woman silenced, we lose a valuable voice in the news. 
I'll leave it there for now. And I look forward to participating in the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elisa. And now I'm going to welcome our other panelists, uh, Emily May, co-founder and lead executive officer at right to be and Jareen Iman, who is an award-winning um, journalist, formerly with NBC News and currently with Amazon Ads. So thank you so much uh, for joining me. And, you know, Elisa, the data is staggering. And Emily, I'm going to start with you. Um, what's so interesting is you got into this when you were 24 years old. You started your organization with seven people in 2005. We started in 2004. So we understand what it's like to be, you know, fighting the fight for nearly 20 years. Um, how do we disrupt these cycles of hate and create a world where everyone has the right to feel safe? And if you could talk a little bit about what you're doing with um, uh, right to be and uh, how you are creating a safer world uh, for women. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Madeline. And I do remember when you all launched because we launched right after you. Um, so, so great to be here um, with all of you today, including, you know, our friend Jareen, our partners at IWMF, um, certainly the Gina Davis Institute, and also our incredible and uh, humble but visionary um, funder, Craig Newmark. Um, so at Right to Be, we are working to build a world that uh, is free of harassment and filled with humanity. Um, and you're right, Madeline, I did start this when I was a baby. I was 24 years old um, and really started focusing on this issue of street harassment or sexual harassment in public space. But lo and behold, you can't address harassment or really make social change at all as a woman in the world without getting harassed online. And so we sort of backed ourselves into becoming experts in online harassment through our own experiences and out of a necessity to take care of ourselves and to take care of our community. Um, as part of our work broadly, we've been exploring how we can take care of each other when harassment happens. Um, and one of the, the sort of formal term for, for people taking care of people um, is bystander intervention. So bystander intervention at right to be we have a methodology called the five D's of bystander intervention. And it works if you're in the street. It works if you're online. It works if you're at work. Um, and what we have done, though, is that because the um, the environment around online harassment is very different in the street compared compared to the street or compared to the workplace, um, we have developed a platform where people can share their stories, which we know is one of the number one mechanisms for social change. But then they can also and ask a vetted community of bystanders to show up and to take care of them, whether it be to um, screenshot their harassment and send it to them so they have a record of it, report to the platforms whether where it happened, or just to get supportive messages to counteract all of those that hate that's coming their way um, that Elisa so beautifully outlined. So. That's what what we're up, what we are up to, and and what Craig has really been supporting us in doing. It's sort of in in that it's sort of the, it, in line really with the vision of his life's work of of how can we build online communities to take care of one another. Um, and the platform's been really effective at that. Folks can check it out at stories.righttobe.org. They can share their own story of harassment, or they can sign up to be one of those vetted community of bystanders and support people when they're harassed online. So I have a follow-up question for you. For our audience who may not be familiar, can you just walk us through what's the five Ds? Did you say D as in, yeah, can you walk yeah. us through? Yes, absolutely. So when it comes to online harassment, the five Ds of bystander intervention are this. Number one, distract. Create a distraction to de-escalate the situation. So when you see online harassment, it could be something as simple and as silly as flooding that comment stream that's being flooded with hate with, you know, jumping bunnies or whatever it is. The idea is that you're de-escalating as you go. It's hard to be angry at the world when you're seeing fun or silly uh, content in the way. 
Number two is delegate. So a lot of people think about reporting it to the platform where it has happened. Um, but I also want to encourage people uh, to do something a little broader than that, to think about delegate as your like community organizing tool. Um, we know that when women journalists experience online harassment, the first people that they go to are other women journalists, other gender expansive journalists to be like, hey, can you help me out? right? Or, hey, my friend's being harassed. Can you help them out? Um, that's a great tool when it comes to addressing online harassment. Number three is document, creating documentation of what happened. So this is those screenshots, and they are incredibly important to really have a paper trail because a lot of times this content, hopefully, is taken down by the platforms where it's happened, but you need to have that data in place so that you can address it if it's a long-term safety concern. Number four um, is delay. This is simply that check-in. And when it comes to online harassment, um, this is pretty consistently available to you. You can always, you know, chat or send a DM or show up in the comments and be like, hey, how can I help, right? It's a way of really allowing the person being harassed to say what they need in that moment. Um, if you know somebody personally, you're not just seeing this happen, you know, to a journalist who you don't know personally, um, offer to go and sit with them, offer to order them some dinner, offer to sit with them and go through the digital safety guides that are available on IWMF's website and on our own, right? Like uh, this is overwhelming. And sometimes when we have a core threat to our safety, just having somebody that we care about sit with us is a big deal. Last but not least of these five Ds is direct. So direct is about directly intervening. So maybe saying, hey, this person is impersonating this person. Here's their real handle. Maybe it's about saying, hey, what you're doing is actually really sexist. Maybe you want to check yourself. Maybe it's about setting a boundary and being like, mm, why don't you back off? What you'll notice about right to these five Ds of bystander intervention is I've given you four indirect strategies and only one direct strategy. And the reason is, is because that direct strategy is the one that comes with those safety risks, because it's the one where you're kind of outing yourself as somebody who is taking care of somebody else who's being harassed. The unfortunate realities of how um, online harassment works is that once you're aligned with a person being harassed, you yourself are a target of harassment, particularly if you share identities with that person, um, particularly if you are also a woman or a person of color or LGBTQ or a journalist, right? And or all of those things. Um, and so you really want to take your safety into consideration. But even if you don't feel safe directly intervening, there are four other options that are out there um, for you. And I think when we look at this issue, there's a lot of solutions floating around. But ultimately, this is an issue of a culture in our society, in our world that is still racist, sexist, homophobic, and despite the best efforts of everybody sitting here on this panel, right? And so when we talk about solutions, we have to talk about solutions that are simultaneously dismantling that culture. And every time we signal to people who harass people, what they're doing isn't okay, it shifts that culture ever so slightly. And every time we show people who are experiencing harassment that yeah, online harassment may still happen, but they're going to have a gaggle of amazing humans show up and have their back, it makes them feel bolder and stronger to say what they need to say to make the world a better place. So that's what that's what we're up to at right to be We have free trainings on bystander intervention online supported by Craig Newmark. We do them once a month in partnership with our amazing partners at PEN America. Um, you can go to right be.org and check out the next one. Thank you so much. It's really helpful. So Jereen, I saw you like nodding your head. Uh, you have been on the front lines as an award-winning um, journalist. And just to pick up two of the data points um, from Elisa, that 73% of women journalists have experienced online violence and 20% have been attacked offline. Can you talk about being on the front lines, being the journalist? What has been your um, experience um, and how have you handled it? Yeah, thank you for having me and such an important question and topic. So I have uh, led 
news gathering and um, breaking news teams for several major networks, NBC, CBS, CNN. And one of the most prolific online attacks that I personally have gone through was actually at the time I was working at NBC. I was actually a director leading a team of over 15 journalists at the time globally, and we were covering breaking news. And the story that we were covering that day, incredibly tragic, was the Capital Gazette shooting, which was actually a story about an online harasser of a, a local regional newspaper that then their physical actions turn violent against the journalists um, at that paper. And so when I was uh, working with my team to, we had heard that there was some commotion happening around that area. And we were using social media tools in order to really assess what was going on. And I had actually seen a tweet that was from uh, someone who claimed to be an intern with the Capital Gazette saying that there was a shooter in their newsroom. And I actually reached out to that Twitter user to ask if they were safe and okay. And if they had, if, if they were, um, they could reach out to me to talk to me about the situation. And what unfolded in that short tweet was a series of uh, hours to days of online harassment, uh, death threats from Twitter users, uh, Facebook users, and Instagram users who were calling me and my team and NBC um, vultures and, you know, trying to discredit me. Uh, I've had, I had people, fortunately not, well, they were doxing people who were in my personal network, including my mother. Um, and so this was, it was like incredibly alarming the rapidness of how that was unfolding. At the same time, we still had to cover the story. So I wasn't able to do the reputational damage control that was happening to me while also trying to do news gathering so that we could find out what was happening in that situation because that reporting was actually going to be on nightly news and then the Today Show, which is ultimately what ended up happening is I we did get in contact with the intern. It turned out that that really was a distressed tweet of the intern, um, Anthony Messenger, that's his name. And we actually got in contact with him, spoke to him about this horrific experience where several of his colleagues were murdered. And we had him on the Today Show the very next day to talk about what happened and uh, ultimately led to a very important conversation about how online violence turns to real world violence. And um, in that time, I had gone through having to, you know, contact my family, tell them to find a safe place, like let them know what was happening to me in my um, social media uh, accounts and the kind of violence that I was um, seeing and harassment I was seeing online. And the I it not only impacted me and the people in my inner circle, but also the people who work for me. So the journalists that were in my vicinity, a lot more junior than me who work for me, they were taking on vicarious trauma. So when they were seeing the kind of uh, messages that I was getting, that was um, incredibly demoralizing to them. Many of them were afraid of pursuing and reporting the story. Um, and in fact, the, a lot of the journalists the very next day were telling me that they weren't quite sure they wanted to do this kind of reporting if this is the level of intensity and harassment they would face. And so uh, what I ended up doing from this experience was putting together an NBC a uh, process where journalists, especially those, whether you're digitally working or you know physically on the field, if you do experience online harassment, um, there is a process now that you can go to the security team there. And obviously NBC is a far well resourced machine compared to smaller local uh, organizations. And that's a different topic that I hope we touch on. But um, we had a security team that created a risk assessment to determine 
uh, whether the people that were persistently harassing me had any form of record of violence and how seriously this needed to be escalated to local authorities. We also created a system where um, journalists who are harassed were able to speak to uh, someone, a professional therapist, or someone that they can seek counsel for their own mental health and well being. And additionally, we created basically like a support system where journalists can help journalists in terms of like help distract one of the five D's that was just mentioned um, during an actual at attack that's happening, like to help su send supportive messages or at least like do distractionary things in order to help mitigate the online attack. So that was one of like the most um, pressing and like something that I physically and virtually faced that actually lasted a long time. And, and now fortunately, like nothing substantial materialized in terms of violence, but it did have a lot of impact, not just on my life, but actually a lot on the journalists that also work with me and how they like view their safety online. Thank you so much for that. Elisa, I'm gonna go back to you because there's some really big buckets of information um, that you shared. Not only did you share the data, but uh, this idea uh, and this real world the organization and the targeting of journalists. So it's one thing to say, okay, there's some person who's just, you know, working as an individual, but but you're seeing targeted, organized attacks against journalists. And one of the things I want to pick up also that Jareen said is it's one thing if a journalist is working for major, major media news outlet, but it's something else if they're a, a stringer or freelance or working for a smaller. And so when you think about uh, IWMF, uh, I mean, you work, you've work worked directly with individual, you know, journalists. So if you can talk a little bit and unpack this like organized thing, and then also how you're helping the individual journalist who's not attached to a big news organization. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And Jareen, I'm so sorry that you had to go through that. It's unfortunately not a situation that is uncommon. We hear about very similar situations in the U.S. and all over the world. And the the notion, uh, the, the previous notion that this was just a mob, I think contributed to the convenient notion that there was nothing we could do about it. And that is no longer acceptable. And I think that that is a really uh, striking thing that has come out of Craig's support and the work of so many of the organizations. 70 organizations are part of the Coalition Against Online Violence. And basically what we are saying is that this is not inevitable. It's not the cost of doing business. It's unacceptable. And if you are working with journalists, you have a responsibility to do something about it. It's not, you know, thank you, Doreen, for going through the actions of what has now become a policy at NBC, but you shouldn't have had to do that right? It should have already been in place. There should be policies in place before, during, and after these attacks. And unfortunately, the progression that we see for some of these very high profile attacks are the ones that come out of very big major personalities randomly dropping the name of a woman journalist. Well, one, it's not random. They're doing it on purpose. They know exactly what the consequence of that is. And I always say, it's just putting a target on somebody's back and waiting to see what happens. That's one scenario. But the other scenario is that many, many countries have state-run troll farms that hire people to single out journalists and spend thousands and thousands of, of dollars sitting there targeting women journalists, anybody who opposes their beliefs, their policies, et cetera. And are, they're employed to make people's lives miserable, but it's more than making people's lives miserable when it comes to journalism. It's seriously impacting press freedom and it's impacting the reporting that is taking place and the people who are doing that reporting. So 
a lot can be done to protect journalists. Nothing is foolproof, but one of the things that we recommend immediately that I don't want to go unsaid here is for journalists and media organizations to invest in some kind of service like Delete Me, for example, that will take your personal information offline. And you can't just do this once. It has to be this kind of subscription service that does it continuously throughout the year. You can include the names of your family members, your loved ones. So all of that is scrubbed on a regular basis. That's the bare minimum investment that media organizations should do for their for their reporters. And I would venture to say, because most of most reporters are freelancers, that they should also do it for the freelancers that they employ. If somebody is using a freelancer to report on the war in Ukraine, you can bet that that freelancer is very likely going to be targeted by the Russian troll farms. They should be protected. And I, I think that it should be media organizations that are protecting them. So the IWMF, just to close this, the IWMF is working with media organizations, large and small, with a lot of resources, with very few resources, to help them develop policies that will help prevent this kind of online violence. Thank you so much. So Emily, I'm gonna go back to you. Um, we've talked about how dire of a situation this is. We've talked about what needs to be put in place, but can we have a little positive note? Can you talk about some success stories that have come out um, from your platform? And also, can you go back and discuss how you're vetting to prevent trolls from getting into your platform? Sure. I'll start off with um, with the vetting process. So we do put people through a pretty thorough vetting process, um, you know, and also I can't talk about it at length because the whole idea is that it's not public, right? That's part of what the what the security piece of it is. Um, but we ask people, for example, for their social media profiles. Um, we do do online research about them. Um, we look at their track record, and then we track them once they're inside the platform as well to ensure that they are really stepping up um, into um, uh, into and being who they who they said they are. And I'm happy to report that this platform has been around since launched initially in 2016 with support from the Knight Foundation um, and has uh, never successfully been infiltrated. We also do a massive security audit um, every time we do big updates to the platform as well um, to make sure that folks can't get in there. Um, so it, it is ultimately very secure. And, and, and I think that's part of the success of the platform. You know, we um, have heard and done studies on the impact of the platform time and time again. And what people are telling us is uh, the first, the first study was actually back from 2017, which is very interesting. What they were telling us is that one of the very uh, transformative impacts of the platform wasn't actually one that we intended on having at all. It was the transformative impact of actually calling what they were going through harassment. Instead of calling it the crap you deal with online, the price you pay for being a woman or being journalist or being gay. There was something very powerful about naming it as harassment and then having a community come around you and also naming your experience as harassment. Studies that we've done after that to really focus on the experience of female journalists and gender expansive journalists inside the platform um, have shown us that what female and gender expanded journalists are looking for is a is a private and secure platform that can just be for them by them. So we do we did build that with support of Craig into the platform so that now if you are a female or gender expansive journalist, you can kind of go to a place where it's just you and other female and gender expansive journalists, where they are the only people who see your story. They are the only people who are allowed to um, support you in the event that you experience harassment. Um, so we've really listened and iterated as we've gone. 
Um, another big uh, learning that we've had here, um, and and I will say a surprising learning that we've we've had here is the power of those supportive messages. Um, and I think it really is like if you think about the internet as its own form of journalism. <laughs> It's about that. I think journalists appreciate a balanced perspective. Like, okay, fine. There may be all these people out here in the world who have terrible, offensive, and awful things to say about me and who I am. But there's also all these people out in the world who are celebrating what I'm doing, st sticking my neck out every day for the sake of, of democracy and a better world. Um, so those are just a smattering of things that we've learned as we've studied this platform um, over the years. I have a lot of hope um, when it comes to uh, Broadly, I mean, we call it bystander intervention, but just the power of people taking care of people in the face of, of online harassment. I think that we have, um, uh, I think that we need solutions from government. I think we need solutions from um, social media platforms. But ultimately, if our diagnosis is that this is a cultural problem, we're going to need people that are good at changing culture to intervene and big corporations and, you know, and, and social media companies and, and government, they haven't always had a great track record there. Right. And so I think it takes folks, um, obviously like the organizations in this room, but obviously journalists, right. But also obviously like all the folks who are joining us here today, um, we all have a role in upending this culture that has allowed online harassment to proliferate and become so, so toxic and impactful in our world. I have another question for you. Uh, with the platform, knowing that this is a global issue, is the platform available in other languages? We are testing it out right now just in English um, to really refine it and focus it because as those of you who work in multiple languages know, we at right to be offer trainings in um, through community partners in over 40 languages around the world. Um, once it becomes very, very hard to, to adjust something quickly enough to let it be responsive to the needs. And online harassment is such a quickly changing topic that we have kept it in English right now. That being said, if we can lock into a model and lock in that funding to expand it to other languages, I think that that's a great idea. As you said, this is a, a significant global issue. Thank you for that. So we were talking, I'm going to go back over to Doreen, you know, we were talking about um, hope and support. And uh, can you talk a little bit about how being mentored and also becoming a mentee um, has helped and advanced uh, your career? And you've done such a phenomenal job using your voice to help others. Can you also talk about uh, Women Do News as well? Yeah, so when it comes to mentorship, and uh, I think that there is such a value, not just in terms of like career navigation in journalism, but also I think in terms of understanding like how technology has truly disrupting and changing how we tell stories, how we do our reporting. And I think that there's been a lot of like wonderful ability for, for example, for me to connect with um, different journalists who are at different stages of their life. And my, when I was a Gwen Eiffel fellow with the IWMF, um, my mentor was um, an executive, uh, former executive at CNN. And um, I got a lot of great support from her when I was actually looking to push new policies through in like big corporate newsrooms around safety, around news gathering techniques, around actually getting funding for things like Delete Me, which, um, which you know, uh, is not affordable, uh, unfortunately. It's around like 125 to 30 or $150 a year or, and, you know, I, I've had a lot of very interesting conversations about like trying to enact policies that better protect journalists that are funded by media organizations and having like a senior mentor who has experience navigating the, the politics of um, newsrooms and media organizations has been really helpful and impactful of me, like being informed and making those changes. Additionally, um, I think that as more people, if you are in a position 
in your newsroom where you have some leadership. Uh, so for me, like I was fortunate to be in a position of like senior leadership in order to make changes. But I actually think changes can be made on many different levels. And I think having a coalition of journalists in a media organization that feel passionately about instituting policies around safety and security and mental health well being while doing their jobs. Um, I think that creating that community and actually creating a business plan of how you talk, how you bring these ideas to your board or the, your like network executives and get their funding, I think is absolutely imperative. And I think that one of the big things I'd like to see more journalists feel and understand the empowerment that they have by working together and really thinking about how you talk about these topics in a way that makes business sense for media organizations to want to invest in the security and safety of their journalists. And, um, and it's, it's unfortunate that that work has to fall on journalists, to be quite honest, but I, I've been in this position working in news gathering for a very long time, and harassment is not new. It's been around for decades, and um, especially like, you know, I started at CNN when I was uh, like in 2011, and there was online harassment. And obviously like the internet has grown and become more complex and there become more like of these organized attacks instituted by governments and sanctioned by them. But the reality is that there's been harassment for a long time and media organizations have done really nothing. And so like there, I do think there has to be like larger coalitions of journalists that band together and support each other in order to push these like ideas and policies through in partnership with um, those who are in power. Um, and when it comes to women do news, one of the ways that um, I'm trying to help in, in this next chapter of my life is uh, I'm actually one of the founding members of this nonprofit organization where we help get women journalists and non-binary journalists um, their biographies on Wikipedia because it is the fifth most visited website in the world. And what we have found is that um, through a lot of online attacks that happen, especially organized attacks of stringers, um, uh, journalists that don't have like as high notoriety as say like a broadcast anchor, um, oftentimes we'll see patterns of organized harassment that tries to discredit them. And we've actually seen this with journalists uh, specifically in uh, countries like India and Brazil where they might not have um, a newsroom that has the prolific like resources in order to support them. But if they're able to have like some kind of digital um, footprint that really demonstrates and shows that they are a journalist that's covered, you know, certain types of topics that they are notable and they are important that that can help in like that can help in terms of uh, shielding their reputation to some degree, but also it can help um, in terms of, you know, people intervening and saying, you know, this is a real journalist, like she's doing her job, here's a Wikipedia page. And so we have um, in the past uh, a little over three years been able to get dozens of female journalists onto Wikipedia and help really expand like the biographies of women on like notable women online so that they have the ability to have just something that demonstrates that yes they are who they say they are and you know they there's like a resource for them um so that's something that we've been doing and we've gotten a lot of feedback from female journalists that it's been incredibly helpful for them when they are doing um work digitally and especially news gathering online so I have a question for you because we know uh, Wikipedia does wikithons, which people may not be aware of. Um, do you have any wikithons coming up? Because you don't have to be a journalist to participate in a wikithon, but you do have to go through some training. Is there anything coming up that Jasmine can post in the chat um, for our yeah. audience? I love this question. Yes, we actually have a monthly flash editathon. Um, where my organization invites anybody who's interested in helping female and non-binary journalists get 
biographies up on Wikipedia to come. And we do this digitally. We want to restart doing it physically um, in different cities as well. But we actually guide you through the entire process of how to write a Wikipedia article, like how to source it, how to get it up. And I can send those details so that we can put it in the chat. But um, it's a it's a really great experience and you really don't need to have very much training to do it because we will teach you how to do it. And um, we always have a lot of success uh, when we're working together and getting these up. Well, we'll we'll try to put that in. So I have a question um, for all of you, uh, because the focus of the work of the Institute is really narrative culture change work, mostly in fiction. Uh, we have a lot of storytellers who are in the audience. And when you look at shows like Alaska Daily or other shows, how can popular content, uh, scripted content, help address either the situation or reinforce how important it is to keep women's voices as journalists? Um, what are some stories or storylines you'd like to see are there certain tropes you'd like to see eradicated? Um, what would you know? How can the the world uh, from a narrative uh, culture change work and from TV and film? How can that help? And I'll just let throw it to all of you. That is such an interesting question. Um, well, I know some tropes that for years have bothered me is like the like seductress journalist, right? Like that's something that we've seen across a lot of popular movies. Um, and it's really misrepresentative because it sexualizes female journalists and um, either that or we've seen like the destructive journalist, right? The one who is beaten down or, you know, whatever, going through their vices and they're chasing that, that story of redemption. And I think those things are very, boxed in and uh, you know obviously they make great drama for tv but they're they're actually very destructive in how they showcase women journalists and their the motivations around telling stories and i think that um i like to see a lot more scripted content which is very powerful in informing the zeitgeist and like general narrative i like to see a lot more um, women journalists, like the movie Spotlight, for example, um, with the Boston Globe, that 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 was a great example of um, showing journalists that were more complex, were people that were very invested in their community and telling a story around, um, you know, the Catholic Church in the area. And I thought that that was a really great example of how uh, scripted content can really show journalists in a human, in a humanized fashion, because, you know, a lot of these attacks that organized attacks, like from Donald Trump or President Modi, um, a lot of Prime Minister Modi, a lot of that is uh, the dehumanization of journalists, right? Like, uh, we see a lot of, um, you know, journalists aren't people, they're they're like the media or they're siloed into some kind of label and it causes like a detachment from the general public to understand. And one of the big things that um, I did when I was at NBC and CBS is when we were doing a lot of online news gathering was really demonstrating to like sources that we were talking to that we are people because earning trust was a very big part of, especially when you're digitally news gathering, there's a barrier between understanding like who I'm talking to, are they real? And I do think that like scripted content that's able to demonstrate that aspect of um, the complexity of journalists as people and um, re get rid of those like narrow-minded uh, ways of portrayal, I think can be really impactful in how audiences view journalists. Excellent. Elisa, Emily? Yeah, I think to, to your point about depicting journalists as people, um, I recently watched the Boston Strangler movie, um, which features a woman journalist who has a home life, has children, and, and that is exactly who we know is out there reporting the news. Um, I love the tropes that you raised, which are so awful. Um, 
The other trope I think just needs to go away is the adrenaline junkie trope because 17 years of working in this field, I know that journalists do not do this work because they're adrenaline junkies. They do this work because they are incredibly committed to their communities and to justice. And so more stories about that commitment to justice and to doing the right thing and to holding people to account, I think is critically important. I think right now in this era of distrust of the news media, lack of local news media, which has led to the distrust of the news media. Stories about the importance of journalism for our democracies are just critical. And the role that journalists have played in uh, in holding powers to account. I, there's a great book called uh, Ghosting the News about local news media by Margaret Sullivan that goes through the list of all the things that happen in communities when local news goes away. Corruption increases, poverty increases, pollution increases, graffiti increases. There is nobody holding anybody to account. And so I think that's really important for people to understand. And for my part, I'm going to say I want some media content where there is online harassment that is not just happening to famous people, that is happening to everyday people. And there are some folks out there who are intervening, right? I think we need to show people, we need to model that because we think that intervening in online harassment means putting ourselves at risk. And we need to show people that there's more ways to safely intervene and take care of each other than just directly intervening in, in these situations. Um, we need to give people options. So that's that's my vote. Get, get some bystander intervention content out there and let's teach people how to do this. Thank you. So um, Jasmine Barat, our Senior Director of Events, is going to come on. We have time for two questions. And uh, for all the people that post questions, if you provide us with your email in the Q&A, we'll be happy to get those answered. So Jasmine, over to you. Hi. Yes. Thank you so much. This was, this was amazing. Um, I've learned a lot, so thank you. Um, we have some great questions. I know we only have time for a couple, so I'll jump right into one. But um, Jenny has asked, do you guys collaborate with various journalist associations like National LGBTQ Journalists Association, Association of Hispanic Journalists, Black Journalists, et cetera, to help reach individual journalists with resources? I can jump in. Uh, we collaborate with all of those organizations to uh, make sure that the resources that the IWMF has are known to them. We have emergency funds that we provide. Uh, enormous percentage, I think 80% of our emergency funds are for mental health services, um, which is pretty shocking and a change from just five years ago, uh, we give grants to journalists and really focus on underrepresented communities to make sure that those voices are being heard. So yes, to all of those incredible organizations that are making sure that their journalists are being represented and supported. I, I wanted to add that for Women Do News, we actually go to a lot of the conferences for like um, NABJ, for example, and we have edit-a-thons for uh, what our Women Do News Wikipedias. And if anyone is watching this and they are part of an organization and you want to work with us, please like let's get connected because we'd love to have an edit-a-thon with you and teach you like how to get those great biographies up on Wikipedia. Great. Um... I did see several questions come in wanting to know more about the five Ds. Um, Emily, I know you mentioned there's going to be some free um, training sessions. I did put a link into the chat earlier, but maybe you could just kind of remind folks of what that is and what they would learn and if there's anything else you want to add to that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that question. So for those of you um, interested in the five Ds, so Craig is generously supporting um, us and PEN America in doing these trainings once a month for free. You can go to our training calendar at righttobe.org and click on 
free trainings. When you get to the training, you're going to learn more about what online harassment looks like so that you can identify it. You're going to learn more about the impacts of it. And then we're going to talk about what your concerns about intervening are. We'll also go deeper into what the, which uh, um, how all the five D's work when it comes to online harassment than we were able to go into here today. Um, and then there is a uh, part at the end where, where we practice. Um, we also have a book called I've Got Your Back written by myself and Jorge Arteaga, our vice president, um, that goes through the five D's of bystander intervention. Um, and specifically, there's, there's sections about street, online, workplace, Place, um, but there is a very specific section about online harassment, since that's what we are, are here to talk about today. One of the things that Right to Be is doing, though, is that we don't just want to address any one form of harassment um, because we believe that people's experiences are bigger than that. So when it comes to, we will focus on a form of harassment in terms of providing a training experience. Um, but when it comes to, we know that people who harass online are also have people coming to their homes to harass them. Also have people going to their workplaces to harass them. Also have people harassing them on the street. And so it is one continuous experience, but we also know to the, to the point earlier that if you're harassed for being a female or expand or gender expansive journalist, guess what? You might also have a disability. You might also be a person of color. You might also be a religious minority. And when you are harassed, it might not be clear to you, am I being harassed because I'm a woman, a religious minority, because I'm LGBTQ plus all three at the same time? Like what's going on, right? And so in addition to the amazing, you know, organizations um, that the folks here are partnered with, we're all also partnered um, and, and actively developing content like what with folks like One Million Madly Motivated Moms working on police brutality in Black communities or Asian Americans advancing justice, working on um, addressing anti-Asian hate or eye to eye, working on addressing stigma around folks with learning differences um, or care, working on addressing anti-Muslim harassment. Um, the list goes on. There's 18 of them all in. But when we partner with folks, we partner with folks to develop specific content Content to make sure that we are equipped to develop to address that form of harassment as bystanders and as people who care, knowing that these issues are infinitely complicated and that they require, um, you know, both just the courage to intervene, the knowledge to intervene, um, but also a certain amount of nuance to be able to actually identify what you're looking at as harassment. Well, thank you, everyone. We are at time. We want to thank all of our esteemed panelists. We want to thank our esteemed ASL interpreters. And uh, also, this would not be a possible, once again, without the support of Craig Newmark, Philanthropies. And uh, please do reach out and connect with these organizations. Remember, no gift is too large. They all need support. And we hope you will also stay in touch with the Institute. We have a lot of um, other great programming that's happening the rest of the year. Thank you, everyone. Take care and Thank happy you. Thank you.